L Talk Shop. I am L, and I am here with what may be a British rock star. I'm not entirely sure. This is what happens when Fred gets a hold of my wig stash. Oh, so pretty. Oh, so pretty. <laughs> is he though? Is he though? Is he though? Um, I feel like I'm a fabulous Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> You are what they call in the business yeah. a hot mess. <laughs> All right, so we'll, uh, okay, first painting tip: if your hair looks like this, put it back. Oh yeah, always wear a ponytail holder. That's like really, really important to um, anything you do here. Uh, yeah. So right, right, right. Um. Okay, we'll start taking votes on what color hair Fred should be wearing <laughs> during the broadcast tonight um i'm gonna say let's stick with his own shorn head and we'll go from there so um thanks to everyone's feedback on what we should talk about um on our little broadcast here uh so tonight we thought we would start with paintings we're gonna do this a little bit differently than we did last week in that um i'm going to interview fred and talk about what he does because he is the uh, painting expert in the house. Fun fact, Fred and I actually met over a mutual love of painting war games miniatures. True. So I do have experience in the painting realm, yeah. but um, I'm also super lazy when it comes to painting. And it's much easier for me to say, oh my God, Fred, will you paint this for me? And I'll go, of course, my darling. And then I do. And then he does because he's great. So, um, so Fred, first of all, tell us a little bit about your background because I call you the the master painter. But how did you how did you get that title? Okay, so many, 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 many years ago, um, when I was a wee lad, um, I had three older brothers and a father who was very typical of that era, who worked very hard, came home, ate the big piece of chicken. Um, and sat in his chair, and you generally avoided him um, because he was grumpy. But at the weekends, he had his own hobbies. Okay. And if you wanted Dad's attention, you'd better be interested in something that he was interested in. Um, and my dad's big thing was painting model airplanes, okay. painting model tanks, right. and radio-controlled um, okay. aircraft. Um, and he'd build the old ones where you had, like, the the little wooden pieces and cover them in the strange paper tissue and put stuff that stank the house on it to make it go hard. I think it's actually might even be called doping the, 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 the paper. Doping the paper. I don't know. That sounds rude. Um, <laughs> but I liked what he was doing with the airplanes. So I learned to make airfix kits, model airplanes from right. World War II. Um, he taught me the basic skills and that developed my love for, for painting small things. The, bedroom uh, roof that I shared with one of my brothers was covered with mock dog fights of Spitfires chasing Mr. Schmitz and Mr. Schmitz attacking B-29, B-35s and all kinds of stuff. So this is, if I may interject real quick, this is how I knew that we were meant to be together, even though we were living on separate continents at the time. Because as a child, I was also building uh, model ships in my backyard and setting them on fire on our swimming pool in the backyard to simulate uh, Navy battles. I used to do that. Um, we would string up a wire from my bedroom on the right. top floor down to the ground floor. We'd put metal Vs on top of the old airplanes, the ones that we were replacing with new ones that we just mm -hmm. painted. And then we'd stuff them with cotton wool balls, soak that in petroleum, and then set them on fire as they were actually flying down the wires. <laughs> the fact that we were blowing shit up on two different continents, probably around the same time. We were totally meant to be together. So anyway, continue. You're building model planes with your dad. Um, then I went into the army, and whilst I was in the army, I got into playing rudimentary Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing stuff. Around about that time, I think, Space Crusade and Hero Quest came out from Games Workshop, which oh were uh, which were marketed to the, the mass media. You're so old. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm aware. Um, and then I got started getting into painting miniatures. Mm -hmm. When I left the military, I ended up starting to work for Games Workshop just as a retail assistant. Sure. Um, and over the years of working for GW, my painting skills of painting miniatures got better and better and better mm -hmm. to the point where I discovered that I could make more money painting miniatures than I could for working for Games Workshop. Right. 
So I quit. So you went out on your own. And I painted commission miniatures for many, many years. And that's when I met you. That's true. Because uh, you were being sad and divorced in a, in a gaming store and upsetting all the people that didn't understand why you had a different shape. It was very bumpy. <coughs> very, very bumpy. And the guy that ran your gaming store was one of my clients. Uh-huh. And he put us in contact with each other. Um, long story, lost over the internet. Uh, the way a, most relationships start yeah, these days, right? Yeah, but way before it was a thing. Yeah, yeah. anyway, that's for another podcast. That's another um, Then I developed a micro tremor in my left hand. On my, it's, it's worse in my left than it is on my right. Um, it doesn't affect my ability to paint now, but it completely ruined my ability to paint miniatures to a good standard. I mean, it's hard to paint something this big when you are when you have a real fine Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's not noticeable when I'm moving around, but when I start holding things, right. it's enough that it makes it impossible to do very fine detail. Right. Um, I could probably paint plain miniatures, mm -hmm. but doing faces and insignia on shoulder pads that are the size of your little thumbnail. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Um, Around about that, or shortly after that, we went to Dragon Con. We did, we did. On a whim! <laughs> that's that's for another story, too. Uh, how do you accidentally end up at Dragon Con and have a great time? We'll talk about that later. Um, and then I just translated those skills yeah. onto a bigger thing. We, took, we skilled it up, yeah, right? It was literally that. It, all it was is my ability to visualize where highlight shade and that mm -hmm. sort of thing should go on something very small simply got scaled up so i think that's what um i find interesting <coughs> about the work that you do with cosplay because we both started off on such a tiny tiny scale where it was not unusual for you to spend a lot of time on something that was less than a millimeter long right so we took those skills to doing cosplay uh so but we're still like doing detail on a on a micro level yes right so that's why you have like the constellations on the navigator that are crazy, crazy tiny because we're used to working on such a tiny, tiny scale. But that's not how most people get into to cosplay. I mean, most of the people. I don't, no, I don't, we just, we just wanted to dress up and go back to Dragon Con and get drunk. Well, I mean, that's true. But and look cool. And look cool, right? And as any cosplayer knows, there's a certain amount of ego involved. You know, I mean, you want to show off your stuff. You want people to compliment you. You want people to take pictures of you. Yeah, somebody at Ancient City this week was like, oh, my God, do you mind if, if I take your photo? I'm like, girl, I did not get dressed up like this to not have somebody take my photo. So, yeah, I totally. Um, but as it as it relates to the painting, because I want to get into kind of like, you know, some tips tips and tricks mm -hmm. for people who are, are, are tuning in. Uh, you took those skills from the micro level onto the macro level and for a long time you didn't use a lot of the tools that that other cosplayers typically use like airbrush you were still very much like a Windsor Newton <sighs> tiny tiny detail painter you do what you know right um a typical example if you look at you take three people that are very good at painting mm -hmm. you take me Steve from SKS mm -hmm. and Brittany from Granosa oh Costume so all right good. they're our painting styles are very different and the paints that we use are very different right because that's what we've started with yep. that's what we came through Brittany uses paints that i quite frankly wouldn't don't, spit don't on. talk trash about no no other no people's paint. her paint is garbage as far as i'm concerned it's but like the one dollar stuff extraordinary but her style she uses the fact that it's a very thin peg pigmented paint mm -hmm. to her advantage yeah that's how she creates her blend in that's how she does it right that works for her that makes sense. and she has the patience to use that particular method mm -hmm. i do not mm -hmm. steve because his background is in um technical art right and the paint that he was taught to use when he was at college is the heavy body liquitex paints okay um which in terms of pigmentation are somewhere in the middle between gaming paints and the americana stuff that britney uses gotcha. but his techniques are closer to mine okay because he's used to dealing with a thicker pigment and then watering it down and blending it that way and what paint do you use i, I know the answer but for everybody listening yeah he brought some of his with him it's 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 vallejo so um ah. this is a gaming paint yeah it's designed for gaming miniatures mm -hmm. so it has very high concentrations of, of pigment um and 
that's what I am used to using. I know how to manipulate it. I right. know how to do it. I just happen to think that it's it's better because it's better in other ways. The way sure, that you can in the way that you've it. learned how to use it, it's yeah. better. Um, because you can take one of these, mm -hmm. you combine it with this stuff. What's that? That's airbrush thinner. Okay. And one of these turns into, I don't have one here. There the are one. the um there are the smaller pots that are the same size, but okay. they're the they're, rather than the game color, they're the game air. Those are their oh, airbrush yeah. versions okay. of it. It is exactly the same paint that is pre-diluted to the right stuff. So you technically get less paint. Okay. They're the same price. Right, right, right. So you can take one of these, mm -hmm. mix it properly, dilute it, and one of these turns into five game airs. I think that a lot of people are surprised that you did the Wraith Guard, the 11 foot Wraith Guard, using those small little pots of paint. With a caveat. Okay. All the white pieces were white rattle can. Okay. Okay. The bulk color of the dark green that I used on the green parts mm -hmm. was rattle can. Okay. But then as soon as I started going into blending and actually moving in and applying highlights, I went airbrush, then brush. Gotcha. Um, base coating something, if it's the same color, use a rattle can. Well, it's, it's, so, it's the easiest thing to, to use. So speaking of uh, scaling up your paint, uh, I, was always, I was very intrigued by what you choose to do with the orc, and I can't remember who gave you that piece of advice. Came from Terry. Came from Terry, uh, from Be Cosplay, right? Yeah, that Terry Skinner. Yeah, who told you to... Paint a house because the orc was the size of a house. Um, I I did some rough calculations on square footage mm -hmm. to plasti dip the orc. I would have needed over forty cans of plasti dip <laughs> to cover it at seven eight dollars a can. NASA project management and budgeting would not have permitted that to happen. Um, and I was already looking for an alternative mm -hmm. when Terry happened to mention. That when he painted his marine, he used a very high quality external paint that had latex in it. That makes sense, though, doesn't it? And having experimented with it, it's not great on areas that are very finely detailed. Okay. But for bulk painting, right. um, I now have a proper Craftsman compressor and a paint gun. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, and I not only... When you use that particular paint, it becomes plasti dip and base color all in one go. Right. It's it's both. Okay. It becomes like the ultimate colored plasti dip because you can also have it mixed to the exact shade that you want. So here's a question for you then. Why don't you use that on a smaller scale? It It's a little thicker. It's too thick. Okay. Um, That's good. Good, good. Very fine detail. It tends to blot some of it out. Um because it's a little bit thicker to get it to run through the gun <clears throat> but for flat armor that you don't have a lot of detail on it's perfect it will save you an absolute fortune and you basically cut out the middle man because there's no plastic base coat painting it's just base coat in one color that okay. they mix for you and then go on and paint it with however you want to so um, and it's just as flexible just as durable okay. than, as plastic dip. actually in some ways better interesting because you can't peel it off plastic dip will peel off if you can get it off that stuff will not it will soak down into the pores and that becomes the outer layer so here's a question for you i'm building an ultramarine cosplay yes uh for the first time with pla via 3d printing instead of eva foam oh uh, why are you Where doing that, that to yourself fun? what sort of paint would you recommend to get a good finish and to take out the imperfect imperfections from a pro Answer the question and then insert your personal opinion. Okay, right. So if it's 3D printed, you've got fill lines. Right. Um, you've got two choices. Um, normally, you, you've got something like Ecstasy, which is a two-part resin that you paint over the surface, which is self-leveling and actually gets rid of 90% of the um, the print lines. And who sells that? Uh, I'll get it on Amazon. So, okay. Um, it's just called Ecstasy 3D. Okay. Um, Not the drug. Don't buy X. Mm -hmm. This is a product. Um, the second alternative is to use a filler primer. Okay. Harbor Freight do one that's about 6 or $7 a can. Mm -hmm. You'll get reasonable coverage out of it. For a full-size printed marine, 
you're probably going to use probably nine or ten cans, unfortunately. Right. Um, but that you put a, a, a coat over that, you lightly sand the whole mm -hmm. thing. You put a second coat over the top of it, lightly coat of it. That'll bring it down to a nice smooth surface that you can work on. And then you want to go to good quality rattle cans to get you to your blue paint and then highlight from there. Okay. Um, my next question, do you hate yourself? Now I'm going to interject real quick because uh, it, 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 there's a lot of different products that you can use. And I will actually challenge you a little bit on this because you are used to using foam. Like that is your thing. It's a weight issue. It, okay. So it's a weight issue. It's just, and also when you, you, when you move in a large scale costume, you need it to be able to bend and give in a slight ways as you maneuver around it. And unfortunately, with a 3D printed piece, there's no giving it at all. And you're going to find that it's going to cut into you. It's going to rub in particular places. Okay. Um, I mean, it will look and it will be super durable, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you do a solid thing. But it's also going to become very heavy. So I will. Uh, so I will agree think, with you a bit think on about this as trying well. To think about if you're on 15 inch stilts. Oh yeah. In a full suit of armor. A 3D printed set is probably going to weigh at least double what a foam set weighs, probably more. So is there, a, and, and I want to throw it in here, as as somebody who has handled you and dressed you in these pieces, I, I understand what you're saying because a lot of them kind of like clang into each other. And mm -hmm. part of what makes like the Inquisitor and Power Armor work is that that foam had some give. Yep. So like when the pieces would, would clack, like otherwise clank together, they would kind of smush on each other and allow you to move. Would you recommend <clears throat> any particular pieces that would lend themselves well to 3D printing as opposed to foam and maybe like use use the the, the two media Helmet. together? Helmet. Right. I mean, whenever I'm taking on commissions, if I can find mm -hmm. somebody that either prints or resin casts a helmet, I will take that any day of the week. I mean, look at um, Autumn Samus. Right. Um, and Justin Spartan. Oh, absolutely. Um, same same deal. Pauldrons? Yeah. Especially if you want to get a no nice lot of yep. detail on the, the chapter insignia. Absolutely. Um, you could print the eagle and put it on the chest plate. So that's um, what I was thinking. But any piece that has a tendency to move or flex, having that foam gives you some flexibility that you would otherwise not have. You could, i mean you could get away with them I mean, the feet would print nicely mm -hmm. but you want some movement in the other pieces yeah just so that when you twist or turn on the stilts those bits can actually flex around you yeah. instead of digging in that's as, a great point. That, that that that's all it is and also if you're up on stilts and you've got a lot of weight you've got the backpack is hanging off right. of your back if that was printed it's going to be brutally yeah. brutal on you to wear it Plus, if you start to go, yeah, you're now fighting against more weight against gravity to try and bring yourself it's back up on, on balance. That's all it is. So, I have no problem with 3D reprinting. It's a fantastic. I thing. know it's extraordinary, and the, the level of detail is amazing. I don't want to get too much off track. That yes, talking okay. About printing, uh, but he had another question: Is some of the the um, the materials that you suggested, the the fillers and like the things like ecstasy? Do you know if those are available in the UK? There's bound to be a fitter primer. There okay. must be. I mean, because that's right. an automotive product. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um, and Ecstasy 3D, that's a smooth on product, I believe. I think it is too. But you got, if anybody um, knows, please correct us. Go on to the British forums. I mean, there are yeah. going to be guys who are going to know that question. But one is an automotive spray paint okay. that is designed to go over the surface and fill print lines. Mm -hmm. The other one is deliberately created for 3D products okay. and it's a slow cure. Um, thin resin that's designed to self-level and fill perfect well i want to get into a couple of uh like tips and tricks and some tools um to give people some ideas so what first of all what is the most important tool that you think a painter should have in in their toolkit solid imagination uh, <laughs> okay let's say we can't buy that at hobby lobby uh, <laughs> no, but it can be trained all right that's fair what do you mean by that um when you when you paint something, you pick it up, it's gray or it's black. Pick something or, up. You no, have something over there. Um, no, that's a real thing. I, I, I'm just talking about like when you're about to paint something that has that nothing on it. Okay. All right. 
your ability to visualize how you want it finished dictates what order you do things in. Right. Okay. So you have to be able to see it in your head mm. finished. To do that, you have to be able to have gone and pull up memories of things that are similar. So you have to go around, if you if you aren't particularly old, like me, who has like 50 years of memories to call upon, and look at different things. Don't just walk past stuff. Look at a rusty sign. Stop oh, and look at it. I see what you're it. trying to say. So you're like saying like actually... Like not just to go, oh, I want it to look like this, but actually look at examples of how it's weathered and what the weathering For looks real. like and the coloring and go the to, texture. Go to the like, what's the museum down in St. Augustine, the one with all the weird stuff in it. Uh Ripley's? No, the the, the proper museum. I don't know. The, Museums, they're not in St. Augustine, don't worry about that. There's one of those the light lightner. Lightner. Is that is that a place? It's a place. Yes. Anyway, but it has it doesn't just have artwork in it. Yeah. It has museum pieces. It has mm -hmm. suits of armor. It has on old cars. And those all have different materials. Rubber, iron, yeah, copper. Yeah. Thing. All of those look different ways in different lights. Right. Because the entire purpose of painting something is to make it look like what it does in either a game or real life. So I, I really appreciate that you said that because this is a conversation we're just having <clears throat> um, with some people when we look at an example of something whether or not that's you know something from a video game or what have you my question always is what's the purpose why is it like that yep. why is the staining like that or why is the weathering like that where would that have come from yes and very often when you're just getting into painting things you just splatter it yep. but you have to kind of take a step back and say why did it splatter like why what would it actually look like like rust is always a good example with you is you actually think about when you're rusting something, where would the water have actually dripped down? Where, where would it, the rust where, where come down? Where does it accumulate? Mm -hmm. What's it causing damage to? What's it doing to the paint right. that it runs over? So I would contend that that's not a, a, a an imagination thing. That's that's a research thing. That's it, it, it's, truly it's, it's, understanding it's what both. you want to put out there. Because it's the ability to take disparate images right. that your memory has and imagine them all mm -hmm. together on one thing. Yep. Because, I mean, I cannot even start a project until I can see it in my head doing its thing, be it in a game, be it in a movie, being or whatever. I have to be able to visualize mm -hmm. that as if it was real so that's where i actually struggle because i have trouble bringing up those images so i rely very heavily on reference material mm -hmm. and i do a lot of trial and error with my painting i try something and i'm like nope 100 wrong and i'll kind of have to start over because i don't have your same vision when it comes but to i painting. got that from painting thousands of war games miniatures that is an excellent point right so it's just experience of trying over and over again to see yeah. what works i've done my ten thousand hours that's yeah. true that is really true so I would, so to go back to the question, what's the most important tool? It's a you know sense of imagination, but also it's a, a compulsion to understand what the thing that you're painting should look like. Yes, right. Um, but if we're talking about purely about tools, mm -hmm. um, oh God, it's so annoying to say this, and I hate doing it. You get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, if you want a mediocre paint job, you can use garbage paints with garbage brushes and you'll get at best a mediocre paint job unless you have worked with those particular paints and brushes you just come for hundreds and, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Right. And then you're overcoming the shortcomings of the material right. through your own skill. That's where I believe mm -hmm. Brittany is. Mm -hmm. um, she herself admits that the paints are not the best quality in the entire world, but she but has she's mastered them. She has utterly right. mastered them. Right. Um, so, but uh, so to be fair, it's not always easy to like you know buy your way out of the. No, it's not. I mean, when, like, for example, when I started. I only used the when I started painting miniatures. I used very, very cheap brushes. I used the nasty humbrol paints. That's what I had. Mm -hmm. I've never really moved away from the paints that I've used, but those have improved. Right. Okay. But my tools have. Um, 
unless I'm using a big brush for blocking in, yeah, all of my brushes are. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> You can tell he always has them ready to go brand new. They're Winsor Newton Series 7s. So, but this, I will tell you, directly goes back to your model painting days because you had to have a very precise brush. So your your crutch in a lot of ways is the precision and the high quality of that brush. Absolutely, but, that mm -hmm. also, but that's also allowed me to take very detailed precision work onto my cosplays because I know totally that true. I can, because I can have, I can paint. Mm -hmm. very very not as small as i used to be able right. to but i can still get amazing results mm -hmm. because i know that i'm going to have a paint brush that's going to hold right an absolute point that will flow beautifully with the paints that i'm using that i have absolute control over it and it's going to go where i want it right. and then many years ago when we started doing this my delightful wife owned a very basic airbrush mm -hmm. and when we started getting into cosplay she kept trying to convince me to use it and i really pushed back and i i'm a, I, now i'm older i understand why <coughs> i didn't know it right brush work was my skill mm -hmm. i knew i could do great things with a brush this was a brand new skill set that i was going to have to reset back to zero to learn it and that was scary. Yep, it sure was. And I didn't want to. But then you did. And then I tried it. And this is this is this is the set. Do you still have it? Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, that preceded you in my life. I've had that airbrush longer than I've had bread. So this is a siphon fed mm -hmm. badger one five five. Um it has quite a large nozzle, but it is double action. What double action is means it, it how hard you press it controls how much air goes through it and how much you pull it back controls how much paint goes through it. Mm -hmm. So you have a control in two methods. I'm not going to tell you how to work an airbrush. The YouTube is full of hundreds of videos from people that's, who that's, are far better at airbrushing. So, yeah, for sure. Um, and this was the simple compressor. Mm -hmm. It is either on or it is off. It provides a steady stream of air at about 20 to 25 PSI. Sure. But I can't alter that. Yep. It's either on or it's off. I still use it. Yeah. Because it has a really big bottle and I have bigger ones than this. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to doing, if I want to do a base coat with a very particular color, yep. this is the one that I still use. It was ideal to learn to learn how to work I with. Mean um, Everything that I bring to you is good. You must, you must start believing me. Um, and then a but, question to be thinking about is, do you prefer brush or do you prefer airbrush? I know. It's almost like saying, do you prefer apples or oranges? Because they I both believe they both have their place. Yep. Um, but I want to talk about the fact oh, that yeah, after working with it for a while, I began after watching more YouTube videos and actually painting with it, realizing that I was limited by what I had. Right. So this was a great way to get color on fast and use very little paint. Right. Because airbrush, you, you'll be surprised how far one of these goes with an airbrush. Mm -hmm. Okay. Particularly when you're diluting it. Right. right? Um, the World of Warcraft orc with blue and purple are used two pots of blue and half a pot of purple wow to base coat it that's impressive and then it was just a matter of adding white to those just to create some highlights mm -hmm. but it then got to the point where i needed i needed more control okay um i needed to be able to vary because when you're using an airbrush it all boils down to how close you want to get mm -hmm. um and then the pressure of the and the flu and the 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 fluidity of the paint sure because the, if the pressure is too high and you go too close it starts spidering it starts spraying all yep, over the place I remember that. like rain on the on, on a windshield yep. so the only way to get closer is to turn down the pressure but if you turn down the pressure you have to thin the paint more so that it will still flow through that's that's the general rules for airbrushing that makes sense closer you are lower the pressure mm -hmm. thinner the paint be patient and the first rule of that is is an airbrush is not a rattle can. It is not designed to cover 
large surfaces in one go. You have to kind of work them over. It's still faster than brushing them, particularly when you're using another paint. But now I've upgraded to this thing. Ah! As he breaks it, no, you're not getting a new one. Take good care of it. All right. This is an Iowater Eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, this is their middle of the range one. It's a 0.3 needle, so it's smaller than, than that one. Right. The Neo or the Micron, you get even smaller needles. Okay. Um, double action, great engineering, fantastic control. Mm -hmm. Good for what I want to do. It's not for like micro little bits. Right, right. I ain't drawing super amazing stuff, but I also have a. Oh, I would say you are drawing super amazing stuff, just by the way. Much better compressor. This is a That's Spartec sexy compressor. Right there. It has. Um, I can vary the pressure here. Hold that up. I see it's got, got, it. got a pressure gauge there. Right. So I can alter that so I can lower and raise the pressure. Mm -hmm. It's also got a moisture trap in it so that any moisture that's coming through for being drawn in isn't being injected into the paint so it doesn't mess with consistency. Gotcha. Um, it's solidly reliable. And one of the nicest things I find is unless I am actively working with it, it doesn't make any noise. It's so quiet. It's it just goes brrr. And for those of you who don't know, Fred airbrushes in our house. Uh, both of us are definitely going to die of paint poisoning. I probably have purple sooner. lungs right now. Yeah, purple lungs. Um, yeah, whereas the Badger compressor is on constantly and it's noisy as It is a little bit noisy. So we're getting to the end of our, our time, Fred. So I just wanted to... More time. Go longer. More time. Maybe. Hey, if this is too short, you guys let us know. <clears throat> um, so very quickly, what's your favorite thing to paint? What's your least favorite thing to paint? Because what was funny is that it used to be the color yellow, and then you did the orc. It's it's it's, it's whites and yellows. I mean, the only reason I could get away with doing the yellow orc was because I knew it was going to be dirty, mm -hmm. and I didn't have to be pristine. Right. Um, but getting clean whites and clean yellows are a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, the most fun to do are actually reds. Really? Because they blend together so easily mm. that you can actually create highlights with the same color. You don't actually have to add anything to change it. You can just build it up and blend it out yep. with, the, with the feathering, the colors out and get some beautiful effects. So um, I would, I would, I find that very interesting because I don't think that was always the case with you. Uh, um, reds are very difficult to paint on small scale. Right. Um, because if you try to blend them, mm -hmm. you the only way to make them lighter is to either add yellow or add white. Yeah. In which case, pink, pink, or pink or orange, right. and they're no longer red. Mm -hmm. um, so you end up doing very well. You end up doing line highlighting just yeah. on the very edges of the armor to actually highlight it, which means that they actually end up looking quite flat. Mm -hmm. um, unless you actually start them a lot darker than you would originally intend. I would submit to you that the reason you started really enjoying using red is when you started to master that airbrush. No, absolutely. Because you could see, like, even on the pauldron, I, I think that you brought it out here did, yeah. from the Inquisitor. Uh, you can see, do you have it with you? Mm -hmm. The beauty of the blending of the reds. Well, this is a nice example, I mm -hmm. think, of a mixture of both skill sets. You, can you see that? Yeah, so hold it up just a tiny little bit higher. Beautiful. Can, can you see that there? Yep, that's perfect. All right, so where you can see, this was started with almost a very dark red. Um, um, and then I just I used red, purely just red, and then started, and I was aiming it in so that this barrier on the phone was actually catching the paint and creating this dark band that you can see all the way around the edge. Yep. So I was using the foam detail mm -hmm. to actually control it. And I was just going around and I worked up and the first ones I put almost like a thin glaze of red over the whole yeah. thing. And then I just started going around and around and around mm -hmm. until I actually had like a almost a, a nice red. And then I put a tiny little spot of yellow in it. Yeah. And I was just easing off on the pressure. And then on the upper part here, where I knew the light was going to hit the most, I went almost up to a yellow yes. just to catch it. So that's all I did with the airbrush. But then for the detailing, I went to paintbrush. You went to, and what I really liked about this is that because I think that you questioned yourself when you did that. You're mm. like, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I was like, no, 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 no. Your your style is is really visible in this particular piece. I can see that you brought your your figure painting. But to you this. can actually see that it was it was a originally painted a dark blue, mm -hmm. and then it was a spot of white, and then I added in some pieces, 
and then you can see it. Can you see the bands of color? Oh, for sure. So it got progressively lighter, almost up to a white. It's the same piece. It's the same thing here. It's just mm -hmm. a dark gray, a mid gray, a light gray, a white. Thinking about if it was real, where would the light exactly. catch the, the pieces on it? And that's that's the big thing about painting is knowing where to put the paint. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that's kind of the exercise that any artist goes through, whether or not you're doing cosplay, <coughs> painting, 2D art, is identifying your light I source. would posit that 3D art is easier than 2D art. Mm -hmm. Because if you're painting something on a, on a flat surface and as a two-dimensional art, you have to imagine everything. It's not helping you. It's a flat piece of paper mm -hmm. or a flat whatever right. it is. Something that is actually three-dimensional, you can get most of the work done for you with a strong light source. Um, in miniature gaming world, they generally imagine that there is a strong light source over the left shoulder. Yep. And then everything else is coming down over it. That projects where shadows and highlights go. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing that you would do is take your unpainted miniature and your desk lamp. Yep and bring it up alongside the lamp and look at where are those highlights forming? Where are the shadows forming? Mm -hmm. And you take a mental picture or a real picture, a real, real picture, picture now. Absolutely. Um, and that becomes your guide for where you apply the paint. I do the same thing now. Even now in my workshop, I will pick up something, yep. I will put it underneath my lamps and I will spin it and look around. And even though, from experience i really know where they're gonna go it's just a confirmation for me at this point okay yes yes or something yeah. might catch me slightly different that i've added to oh, oh actually there's more shadow there than i think there should than i thought there would be yeah so once you've done that you have a mental image of shadows and highlights paint is then used to recreate those in the color that you want and if i may throw this out there uh it's a it's a phrase that I have heard in my head since I was a junior in high school when I took commercial art, where my instructor would scream at us constantly, contrast. Yeah. Contrast is what makes your art look good. Yeah. So even on that pauldron where you brought those reds down to almost a black mm -hmm. along the, the edges and then you brought them up to the highlights, when you have contrast, you have good art. Well, I mean, a, there's actually a good little example of that one here. Um, I think the whole thing is that example. No, actually, they put up put in color. Look at the difference between this is a flat globe. Mm -hmm. Can you see this? Hold it up, uh, kind of like on an angle. There, down. There. Yeah, there you can see. See it. that? Yep. That is almost a white mm -hmm. in terms of blue, and from here at a camera angle, it looks it probably looks a bit weird that it is so light. But when you take it away, it is exactly the way it's supposed to look. It's catching that light. It actually looks like it's catching the light. And it also, it works, especially when you're working on a foam where it doesn't naturally catch light, you're creating the shine that you would not otherwise catch um, that you may on a, a more, a, a shinier, more reflective material. You know, like the fact that it's because of the shadow that's being cast from mm -hmm. down here, this bit is almost a blue black. Correct. Whereas this bit is a light because the light is actually coming through and catching it on the side. So all paintwork is designed to simulate what it would do if it was if you had a, a good strong light source over the top. One thing, and it's what makes your colors pop. One thing I always remember about you when you were painting miniatures is that you would go out and grab gravel to put on your bases, mm -hmm. and then you would paint the rocks to look like rocks. They didn't look right because they didn't look right, and I think that's something you can even take into the cosplay is that you are trying to to paint something that looks cohesive. Mm -hmm. You're trying to match your styles. You're trying to simulate those, uh, the the lights and darks, but you also have to, like, you have to remember, it's like you're trying to paint it to look like a thing. So yes, when you're out in your cosplay, the light exists and it's going to be bouncing off, but it's your job when you're painting it to, to amplify those lights and darks so that when people walk up on you, they're like, <coughs> wow. Well, I mean, if, if you don't have massive amounts of contrast in terms of highlights and shade, when your cosplay is viewed from 15, 20 feet away, it will look flat. Mm -hmm. um, it just it just will. Right. Whereas if you go over the top in terms of shade and highlight, it will look great. And then as you, people get closer, 
Um, what's his name? If you can't blind them with silence, baff, blind them with silence, baffle them with bullshit. That's why when you get closer, when the paint might start to look a bit weird because it is so highlighted, mm -hmm. that's when they start catching details. Yes. Where that is, their mind is distracted by, hang on a second, is there goddamn Latin script all over the top of this armor plating? There is. And then their mind is gone. Yes. And all they remember now is, wow, it was awesome from a distance. And it was crazy when you got closer. It got better as you got closer. So, so. It, we are right. getting to the end of our time. This is actually, but I, I mean, I talk to you all day long and I get to see this in, in person and hear from you, but um, it is always fascinating to hear your, what's going on in your brain. Oh you no, do don't dig too deep. <laughs> uh, but um, maybe we'll, um, we'll do some follow up with painting techniques and maybe dig down in some other ones. But I just want to thank everybody for hanging out with us. Keep sending your ideas and we will see you next Saturday where we talk shop.